All right, let's talk again about the Constitution. I want you to be able to list the three parts and describe what each part does. The preamble, the articles, and the amendments. And we'll pick up where we left off, which was the articles. And we're specifically talking about Article 2. In the first video, we spent a lot of time on the preamble. In the second video, yeah, I'm starting the timer. It started. And in the second video, I talked mainly about Article 1, which specifically talks about the legislative branch and all the powers of which the legislative branch has. Today, we'll spend most of the time on Article 2. So let's get to it flying through here. Article 1, all these wonderful powers that are explicitly listed in the enumerated powers. And then we last talked about the checks and balances limiting each branch of government so that one government doesn't abuse its power or abuse the citizens. We talked about Article 1, Section 7, where it specifically tells us how to make a law. Now let's quickly talk about Article 2. We'll talk probably about the judicial branch today, which is also in Article 3. And then maybe we'll even get to how do we amend the Constitution and then the specific amendments. But let's see. We'll, we'll get there when we get there. So again, we're listing the specific parts of the Constitution, preamble, articles, amendments, and then explaining basically what they do. You do not need to memorize everything in Article 1. You do not need to memorize everything in Article 2 and then be able to apply it. We're not going that far. I just want you to have a general idea and concept of what's happening in the articles of the Constitution. What is going on? What are they telling us about? So in Article 2 of the Constitution, it explains mainly the executive branch of our government. And it says that the executive branch will be headed or led by a president and a vice president. This is written in Article 2 of the Constitution. I will say that the president is elected for four years. He's got to be 35 years old. This is specifically written in the Constitution. It's been there since the very beginning, day one, 1787. It's still there today, and we still follow it today. We follow everything that is in the Constitution. He's got to be 35 years old, and the Constitution says that the president is elected by the Electoral College, not a popular vote. It's been that way forever. If you want to change that, you have to amend the Constitution, which is very difficult. So when you see people online and on Twitter losing their mind, because that's what people do on Twitter, and saying, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. Al Gore won, almost he won the popular vote. The popular vote doesn't matter. If you get the most votes, cool. Have a cookie. It doesn't matter. Congratulations. You won a game that no one was playing. The game that we are playing is called the Electoral College, and that is what elects the president. And specifically how the Electoral College runs and how it works, it's in the Constitution. You want to change it, it's fine. You have to amend the Constitution, which we'll talk about later. The president is the commander-in-chief, so he is in charge of the military. Why? Because that's what we, the people, decided when we wrote and approved the Constitution at the very beginning. The president has the power to pardon criminals. So say you're a criminal and you do something wrong, the president has the power to say, you know what, I don't agree, or we think you've done enough time, you are free, you're good to go. president can make treaties. Now, just because he makes a treaty with another country, he says, I want to sign a peace treaty, or comes to an agreement with another country, specifically in the Constitution, it says that the Senate, though, has to agree to that. He can write it and say, hey, Iran, I don't like you having nuclear weapons. We need to work out some sort of agreement that keeps you, Iran, from making nuclear weapons. And you write up the agreement, you write up the treaty, they agree to it, and then the president says, well, I agree to it, but it doesn't matter because he has to get the senator to agree. The Senate has to vote yes, and then it becomes a thing that we follow, and we abide by our part of the treaty, and they abide by their part of the treaty. President writes them, Senate must approve them. Again, it's an example of two branches of the government working together so that one branch is not super powerful. We hear a lot about, oh, the president's ruining the country. And we've, look, that's not new, folks. People have been talking about that forever. People always blame the president. They overreact to the president. If the president's a Republican, if the president's a Democrat, it doesn't matter. People always blame and think that the, the president's doing all these terrible things. We have a government that is designed to prevent that exact problem. The president is prevented from abusing his power because of these checks and balances that have been specifically written into the Constitution to keep the president from doing too much. You're doing too much. Uh, the president gets to appoint judges and officials in the judicial branch, but again, the president can't do everything he wants. Just because the, the president finds a judge that he likes, that agrees with him, he's like, yeah, getting my guys into the judicial branch, and then we're going to share. Whoa, 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 whoa. Before that happens, 
the Senate has to approve your guy. So just because you picked a guy that you like and you think is going to agree with you, not so fast. This other separate branch of the government must agree to put that judge there. Limiting power. You see how this works? The government branch, there's not one power that has more than the other. There's not one that has more power than the other. They level out and they're equal checks and balances. And then also in Article 2 of the Constitution, it states that the go the president must give a State of the Union address every year. And he basically explains to us what's going on. He tells us what's going on in the country every January. You can turn on your TV, middle of January, the president will go on, give a speech and say, yo, this is the state. Now, that's confusing. Like State of the Union, you mean like states? No, like state as in condition. State as in state of matter. What he is saying is the condition of the country. Are there jobs? Is there racial problems? Are we going to war? Is there peace? Does it look like things are going well? Are we getting along with each other? What is the condition of our country? How does education look? What are some of the changes we might make? Gives a speech every single year. Every president must follow that. Article three of the Constitution basically explains our court system, and it would later be cleared up by the Judiciary Act, which is one of the original, one of the earliest laws in our country, because Article three doesn't go into enough detail, unfortunately. They didn't spend enough time. Spend all this time in Article one, you spend all this time in Article two, and then like, hey, Article three, it's, it's our court system. Let's move on. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. You spent all this time writing Article one. You went into all these details in Article two, and then Article three, you're like, yeah, we're going to have a couple courts. All right, uh, let's move on. Like, whoop, 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 whoop. you probably should spend enough time. They did it. So eventually they cleared up in the Judiciary Act. But here's how it works. They create U.S. district courts. And this is where most of the cases will go. So if there's a crime, if there's a civil case, if it's federal, it goes to U.S. district court. And it's, this is explained in the Constitution. Then if you don't like your decision in the U.S. district court, let's say we find you guilty of murder. And you're like, but I didn't do it. You can appeal to the Circuit Court of Appeals, and this is where you appeal. This is written in the Constitution, Article 3, which explains our judicial branch. Also, these ideas are cleared up by the Judiciary Act. It explains in more detail exactly how it goes. So you get to trial. You can appeal. If you win your appeal, you'll go back to the district court, and you'll have a trial again. If your appeal is denied, you're done. Sorry, you did it. You're guilty. Game over. Just the way it is. Well, I want to appeal. It's, you can't just appeal and appeal and appeal. It doesn't work that way. So U.S. District Court is where original cases are held. The Circuit of Court of Appeals hears appeals. You don't go directly to that. It's just appeals from the district courts and lower courts. And then finally, Article 3 of the Constitution explains the Supreme Court. And this is the final court of appeal. Well, actually, you can keep appealing upward if you don't like what you get. And you go to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will listen to your case. Uh, it's very rare, but also the Supreme Court will initially hear constitutional matters. If what you have done or the issue surrounding two different parties or two different people is a constitutional matter, a matter that reflects a basic law in the Constitution and it, determined, and it needs to be determined by the Supreme Court. They will interpret what the Constitution says and make a decision based upon that. Gets into some heavy details there, but basically most cases are going to go to the district court. The Court of Appeals will hear appeals from the district court and the Supreme Court will also hear appeals from the Court of Appeals. So appeals will go to the Supreme Court. That means basically a redo. I don't like the decision. I want another chance. I don't like the, I want, I don't agree. Or it flips back and forth. And so redos will go to the Supreme Court if they decide to hear your case. And also court cases that directly involve specific matters that are not clear based on the Constitution. If we look at the words in Article 1, Article 2, or in the preamble, there's some sort of issue that is happening that is directly in conflict or can be directly resolved by something that is written in the Constitution, then the Supreme Court will make the decision. And that's explained in Article 3. Basically, what you need to know, here's a little bit of a secret here. Article 3, all you really need to know is it deals with the courts. <laughs> That's it, folks. Right, right, what was the point of this video? List the three parts of the Constitution. The preamble. You forgot? The articles and then the amendment. So the preamble gives us the basic idea of the government. The articles tell us the basic structure. Now, the, the preamble gives us the purpose and what the government needs to do and why we created the government. The articles gives us the basic structure and organization, like the articles. Article 1, 2, and 3, legislative branch, makes laws, executive branch basically enforces laws, and Article 3 creates the, the our court system. That's it. You don't know need to know right now the specific details of the court system. And I'm sorry that I even bothered you with that on the screen. But hey, you, you know a little bit more than you need to know. That's good.
Uh, Article 4 explains that uh, the concept of federalism, and this is how our government works. We have a federalist government, and that is that our power flows down. We have a federal government, and then we have state governments. This is the state of Virginia, and then this is a county in Virginia called Franklin County. So we have a federal government that makes federal laws and has federal procedures, and then you have a state government that has state laws, and it has state roles and powers, and they do specific stuff in the state. And then you have a local government that has power to do specific things. The federal government can't do everything, so it gives some of its power to the state government. And the state can't really go over every little county in every little town, so it gives some of its power to the county because there are specific small things like, hey, there's broken glass down on Cobra Street. Well, Donald Trump's not going to go, hey, uh, we need somebody going down to Cobra Street and sweep that glass up. That's not – like the governor of Virginia doesn't know or where – well, I mean, we're talking about North Carolina, but the governor doesn't know where that specific street is and doesn't even know who to tell to tell who to tell. Like, who do you tell that person and what person would tell that? Like, that's it's too small. It's too local. And so you say, all right, there's going to be some things that the federal government's going to deal with. And there's going to be some things that specifically are best for the state. And then there's going to be some things that are best suited for your county or your city government to deal with. That is federalism. Each different uh, organization has its own power. But if we're deciding who has the most, federal government always wins. It's the most powerful. If there's a conflict between the state of Virginia and the county of Franklin County or the county of Davidson County and the state of North Carolina, the state wins. And if the state of North Carolina or the state of Virginia has an argument with a federal rule, the federal law wins. That's how federalism works. Article five. So we're getting into these articles, getting pretty heavy, getting pretty deep. There are two ways, two, 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 two ways to amend or change the Constitution. So we go back to that idea from earlier, like, man, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. Why isn't she president? The reason why she isn't president is because the popular vote does not matter. It has no impact. We have an electoral college, according to the Constitution, and the electoral college, based on state and state populations, elects our presidents. That's the way it is. Now, if you want to change that, you can. You have to change the Constitution. Two ways to do that. Number one way to change the Constitution. This is written in Article 5. Remember, preamble, articles, amendments. Oh, the amendments are the things that we're talking about here in Article 5. How do we create those? Step one, we have a national Congress proposes a change to the Constitution. So in Washington, D.C., the Congress gets together and they vote for a change. They say, we want a popular vote. 66% of the 535 representatives in Congress, they represent the entire nation, all the representatives from North Carolina, all the representatives from Florida, from Virginia, from California, from North Dakota, they all come together and the two senators from every state, they all come together in one room and they vote. 66%, not just a majority. A majority is hard enough to get, but 66% of those people have to agree. It's very hard to get 66% of anyone to agree. So you got to get them to agree that let's get rid of the Electoral College. That's just step one of this game. You got to get to step two. Then it goes to the states. Every state then has to vote. The, the government of each and every state will get together and vote. Do we want to get rid of the Electoral College and decide the president based on a popular vote. So if it passes step one, it then goes to step two. And in that case, you got to get 75 for our We thought 66% was hard. 77% or 75%. That's even harder. So 75% of these 50 states must vote. Yes. Electoral college, you're gone. We're going to go popular vote. Very difficult to do. Probably never going to happen. There have only been 27 amendments added to our U.S. Constitution. 27 changes have happened. Over 20,000 amendments have been proposed over the 200 course year history of America. 20,000! And only 27 times have they been able to advance past step one and get to step two. The other way is a state demanded convention proposes. And then we go to this way. This way never really happens. This is very rare. The state demanded convention and you get the states to all agree and then you get the states to agree. It's, it's weird. This one doesn't really happen. This is typically what happens. Congress votes yes and then every single state votes yes. This one is what has happened for, I believe, all 27 amendments. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say 20,000? It's only 11,000. Still, that's a lot. 11,000 amendments. Only 27 have been ratified. 
23 seconds. Article 6, the U.S. Constitution is a supreme law of the land. Number one, federal law, state law, county law, town law. All the laws that we've added over the last 200 years, like you can't ride your bicycle on Sunday. Does it exist? I don't know. Don't spit on the sidewalk. All those small laws are inferior, the superior number one law of land. Every law that we write must follow the Constitution. If you want to make a law today, it must follow the words that were written in the original Constitution. All right, that's it. We made it through the articles, the preamble, the articles. And now we're going to tackle the amendments in the next video. We probably won't even use all 15 minutes.